With increased emphasis on physical fitness, the physician and orthopedic surgeon may encounter many problems about the shoulder and elbow region. With painful conditions in the upper extremity, the physician must thoroughly examine the cervical spine region as outlined in the video program on the examination of the cervical spine. Be certain that pain is not referred from the cervical spine. The shoulder. The shoulder region involves not only the glenohumeral joint, but also the acromioclavicular joint, the sternoclavicular joint, and the articulation between the scapula and the thorax. Pathology at any one of these locations can affect the overall movement of the shoulder. Inspection. With the patient undressed at least to the waist, note that when the patient is walking, the arms swing in unison with the opposite leg, and that the motion is smooth and symmetrical. Any dissimilarity in motion between the two upper extremities should suggest to the examiner the possibility that pathology exists. Note the attitude of the upper extremities with the patient standing in the relaxed position. These should be symmetrical, although the shoulder on the dominant side may be lower, and this asymmetry is not abnormal. Beginning medially, observe the clavicles bilaterally, as they course laterally towards the acromion. More laterally, inspect the deltoid region and compare to the opposite shoulder, noting any atrophy or abnormal contours. In the normal patient, complete symmetry is expected. Next, observe the patient from behind. Note the symmetry of the trapezius regions in the normal individual. The spines of the scapula may be visible, and note that they are normally at the same level. Carefully inspect the supraspinous and infraspinous regions, noting any atrophy as compared to the opposite side. Palpation. Bony landmarks. It is wise to commence palpation of the shoulder region from the front so that eye contact can be maintained with the patient. In the midline, localize the suprasternal notch, and moving laterally, the examiner will encounter the medial end of the clavicle slightly above the suprasternal notch. This denotes the region of the sternoclavicular joint, and both must be palpated, noting any tenderness or asymmetry. The clavicle should be carefully palpated throughout its length to its junction with the acromion at the acromioclavicular joint. Note any tenderness or deformity along the course of the clavicle or at the acromioclavicular joint. The bony landmarks on the opposite shoulder must be identified for comparison. Now that the examiner has established rapport with the patient and gained the patient's confidence, I find that it is easier to conduct the remainder of the bony landmark localization from behind with the patient sitting in a relaxed position. Do not forget to maintain verbal contact with the patient and explain what you are going to do so that the patient will not be startled. If possible, observing the patient's face in a mirror while palpating from behind is of great assistance. Coracoid process. Laterally, at the deepest aspect of the anterior border of the clavicle, course inferiorly approximately one inch, and the tip of the coracoid process is palpable. Acromioclavicular joint. Return to the region of the acromioclavicular joint. Instruct the patient to flex and extend the shoulder, and movement at the acromioclavicular joint can be appreciated. Any tenderness or crepitus should be noted as well as asymmetry as compared to the opposite acromioclavicular joint. Acromion. Superiorly, the acromion protects the humeral head, and by palpating posteriorly over the rectangular acromion, the posterolateral corner at its junction with the spine of the scapula is readily identified. Follow the lateral border of the acromion anteriorly to its anterolateral angle. 
Palpating inferiorly, the examiner encounters the greater tuberosity of the humerus. By asking the patient to internally and externally rotate the shoulder, the examiner can appreciate movement of the greater tuberosity. Spine of scapula. Return to the posterolateral lateral angle of the acromion and continue palpating medially along the spine of the scapula. Scapula. At the medial end of the scapular spine, follow the medial border of the scapula inferiorly to the inferior angle of the scapula. The lateral border of the scapula is then followed superiorly and laterally. Return to the medial end of the scapular spine and palpate superiorly towards the superior medial angle of the scapula. This bony landmark is not as prominent as the inferior angle, but can easily be appreciated by having the patient flex and extend the shoulder. Palpation. Soft tissues. In soft tissue palpation about the shoulder, the examiner should consider four separate aspects. Bursa, tendons, axilla, muscles. Bursa, subdeltoid subacromial. The region of the subdeltoid subacromial bursa should be palpated gently, especially in the patient with an inflammatory process involving the bursa. The subdeltoid portion extends below the acromion laterally and anteriorly. The subacromial portion may be made more prominent anteriorly by passively extending the patient's shoulder. Tendons. The rotator cuff is comprised of the subscapularis, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. The subscapularis tendon is anterior to the shoulder joint and is not by itself palpable. The remaining tendons of the rotator cuff, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor, insert into the greater tuberosity and inferiorly along the posterior aspect of the upper humerus. Return to the greater tuberosity previously identified and by passively extending the shoulder, the examiner can palpate the region of the tendinous insertion of the supraspinatus tendon. Bicipital tendon. Return to the coracoid process anteriorly and move the examining fingers approximately one centimeter laterally. With the other hand, flex the patient's elbow to 90 degrees and rotate the arm towards and away from the body. A depression between the greater and lesser tuberosities is palpable with passive rotation of the humerus. This is the region of the bicepital groove, and the biceps tendon courses distally in the groove. An inflammatory condition of the biceps tendon in the bicepital groove will cause pain as it rotates under the examiner's fingers, and this pain will dissipate as it rotates outwards or inwards. Even in the normal individual, this test may cause some tenderness, and as in all parts of the examination, comparison with the opposite side is essential before reaching the conclusion that pathology has been identified. Axilla. The axilla must be palpated carefully. The arm is abducted to the side and the examiner's hand introduced into the axilla. Carefully palpate for lymph nodes or any other masses and note any areas of tenderness. Medially, the ribs and overlying serratus anterior muscle can be palpated. In the apex of the axilla, the axillary artery can be palpated by gentle pressure on the medial aspect of the upper humerus. Muscles. Pectoralis major. With the examiner's hand positioned in the axilla, gradually abduct the arm and the lateral edge of the pectoralis major muscle can be easily identified between the thumb and fingers. It should be palpated medially to its origin from the medial two-thirds of the clavicle and the lateral border of the sternum. Latissimus dorsi. 
The posterior wall of the axilla may likewise be grasped between the thumb and the fingers. This is the lateral border of the latissimus dorsi, which can be palpated downwards onto the posterior lateral chest wall. Deltoid. The deltoid muscle should be palpated from its origin on the lateral one-third of the clavicle, around the acromial border and spine of the scapula, and inferiorly to its insertion on the lateral aspect of the humerus. Trapezius. The superior lateral border of the trapezius can be identified posteriorly by grasping the lateral edge between the thumb and fingers. Carefully palpate the muscle towards its cervical origin and then inferiorly to the insertion on the scapular spine and from the medial aspect of the spine inferiorly towards its origin from the spinous process of T12. Range of motion. Active. Motion at the shoulder joint complex or shoulder girdle may involve more than one of four articulations, namely the glenohumeral joint, the acromioclavicular joint, the sternoclavicular joint, and the scapulothoracic articulation. Motions at the glenohumeral joint include abduction, adduction, internal rotation, external rotation, flexion, and extension. Any limitation of motion involving the shoulder complex can greatly affect the activities of daily living and it is wise for the examiner to instruct the patient to perform routine activities to see if there is a significant functional loss. Abduction and external rotation. The patient is asked to place the hand on the back of the head as in combing the hair, and subsequently to reach across the opposite scapular region to scratch the back. This latter test is known as the Apley scratch test. Adduction and internal rotation. The patient is asked to reach across the body anteriorly to the opposite shoulder. Also, the patient can be asked to reach behind the back as in removing the wallet from the back pocket in the male or doing up the brassiere in the female. The smoothness and rhythm should be assessed during the motions and any loss of motion or asymmetry between the two sides should be noted. To assess both shoulder movements at once, have the patient stand, keep the elbows straight, and fully supinate the palms. Instruct the patient to bring the arms up over the head laterally and touch the palms together. Next, have the patient reach behind the back and reach as high as possible. Testing both shoulders at once allows minor losses of range of motion to be easily detected by the examiner. Isolated active ranges. Abduction. Stand behind the patient and gently grasp the inferior angle of the scapula and ask the patient to slowly abduct the arm. Note that in the initial 25 to 35 degrees, there is no motion of the inferior angle of the scapula, but beyond this point, the inferior angle begins to rotate laterally, and motion is occurring at the glenohumeral joint and the scapulothoracic articulation in a two-to-one ratio. Hence, pathology at either the glenohumeral joint or the scapulothoracic articulation may limit abduction. Note also that at approximately 120 degrees of abduction, the patient externally rotates the arm to avoid impingement of the greater tuberosity on the antero-inferior aspect of the acromion. During testing of active range of motion, the examiner is reminded to observe any hesitancy or break in smooth rhythm and also to instruct the patient to report any pain or discomfort and to localize it accurately. Also, when testing active abduction,
place your hand across the top of the shoulder and crepitations emanating from the subacromial region may be palpable in degenerative tendonitis of the rotator cuff. Adduction, 45 degrees. Instruct the patient to bring the arm across the chest as in reaching for the opposite shoulder. External rotation, 45 degrees. With the elbow maintained at the side and the forearm pointing straight forward, instruct the patient to move the forearm away from the body. The arc of rotation from the neutral position can be measured with a goniometer and is normally approximately 45 degrees. Internal rotation, 55 degrees. Instruct the patient to internally rotate or bring the forearm towards the abdomen. In this position, approximately 55 degrees of motion may be achieved. Flexion, 180 degrees. Instruct the patient to bring the arm up in front over the head. As will be seen when testing passive motion, both scapulothoracic and glenohumeral motion are involved and true glenohumeral flexion is only about 90 degrees. Extension, 45 degrees. Instruct the patient to move the arm straight back and again this involves both glenohumeral and scapulothoracic motion. True glenohumeral motion is approximately 45 degrees. Range of motion. Passive. Loss of full active motion of the shoulder may be due to the following reasons. Pain inhibition, muscle weakness, soft tissue impingement, soft tissue contractures, bony blockage or impingement, ankylosis or fusion. Shoulder motion is also dependent upon more than one articulation and hence pathology involving one or more of these articulations may prevent full active range of motion. Assessment of passive range of motion is therefore essential to isolate motion at the various articulations and also to try and assess which of the various causes may be responsible for the loss of range of active motion. Abduction. Abduction involves both glenohumeral and scapulothoracic motion. In this patient with a frozen shoulder syndrome, glenohumeral motion is restricted, but the patient may still be able to abduct to approximately 75 degrees using scapulothoracic motion. To test pure glenohumeral motion, anchor the scapula by grasping the inferior angle to prevent scapulothoracic motion, then passively abduct the humerus. In the position shown, approximately 90 degrees of glenohumeral motion may be obtained, whereas this will be severely limited in the patient with frozen shoulder syndrome. In order to eliminate scapulothoracic motion, the examiner's hand can also be placed firmly on top of the acromion and with the other hand gently grasp the upper arm just above the elbow and abduct the arm. The point at which the scapula begins to move can be appreciated by the anchoring hand across the top of the acromion. Rotation. Rotation is assessed passively by having the elbow flexed to 90 degrees and the forearm supported by the examiner. The elbow must be maintained against the side of the body in order to assess pure glenohumeral rotation. Internally, and externally rotate the shoulder using the forearm as a lever. Likewise, with the patient lying supine, the arm is abducted to 90 degrees and with the forearm perpendicular to the examining table, rotate the forearm towards the foot, internal rotation, and towards the head, external rotation, and the angle of the arc can be measured. Adduction. With the patient in the standing position, anchor the scapula by placing the hand across the top of the acromion. Adduct the upper arm across the front of the body, noting the range of motion. 
flexion, extension. Anchor the scapula by again placing the hand firmly on top of the acromion. Grasp the upper arm just above the elbow and passively flex the shoulder by bringing the upper arm anteriorly. Note that with the scapula anchored, true glenohumeral flexion is only 90 degrees. Likewise, bring the upper arm straight back from the neutral position and note that true glenohumeral extension is approximately 45 degrees. Neurological Examination The neurological examination of the shoulder girdle complex would normally be assessed at this time, but will be described in detail in the video program on the cervical spine and neurological examination of the upper extremity. Special Tests Impingement Syndromes Activities which involve arm elevation are commonly performed anteriorly and tennis is an example. The greater tuberosity and supraspinatus tendon with the long head of the biceps medially and the infraspinatus tendon posterior laterally are thus brought into close approximation with the anterior edge of the acromion, the coracoacromial ligament, and the undersurface of the acromioclavicular joint. Impingement test. The upper arm is kept in neutral rotation and is forcibly flexed so that the greater tuberosity will approximate the anterior inferior surface of the acromion. Production of anterior pain and an associated facial grimace would denote the presence of a positive impingement test suggesting supraspinatus tendonitis. Diminution or complete resolution of pain following the subacromial injection of local anesthesia further substantiates the diagnosis. Another modification of this impingement test is to flex the arm to 90 degrees in the neutral abduction-adduction position and forcibly internally rotate the humerus which causes the supraspinatus tendon to impinge against the coracoacromial ligament. Tests for bicipital tendonitis. Palpation. As previously noted, tenderness elicited while palpating the region of the bicipital groove is suggestive of bicipital tendonitis. Straight arm raising test. With the elbow extended and the forearm supinated, resist forward flexion of the humerus. Pain elicited in the region of the bicipital groove is suggestive of bicipital tendonitis. Resisted supination test. Since the biceps is primarily a supinator of the forearm, supination against resistance will produce pain in the region of the bicipital groove if bicipital tendonitis is present. With the arm at the side and the elbow flexed to 90 degrees, the examiner grasps the patient's hand and attempts to pronate while instructing the patient to supinate. Tests for biceps tendon instability. With the elbow flexed to 90 degrees, stabilize the elbow at the patient's side and pull straight down on the elbow. Grasp the forearm at the wrist region and externally rotate the humerus while asking the patient to resist external rotation. If the biceps tendon displaces from the bicipital groove, the patient will experience pain in that region and may also appreciate a popping sensation. Tests for rotator cuff tear. Patients with a rotator cuff tear commonly present with weakness of abduction and external rotation. Instruct the patient to abduct and maintain the arm at 90 degrees. On the side with the rotator cuff tear, the examiner can easily overcome the patient's ability to maintain this abducted position. Likewise, the examiner can easily overcome the patient's ability to maintain external rotation. 
Inability to initiate or maintain abduction in the absence of a neurological deficit suggests the possibility of a major rotator cuff tear, as seen by the leakage of contrast material through the rotator cuff defect into the subacromial and subdeltoid bursa. Instability tests. Shoulder instability may be anterior, inferior, posterior, or multidirectional, and an accurate assessment and grading of the instability must be made before appropriate therapy can be undertaken. Anterior instability. Apprehension test. With the patient sitting and relaxed, grasp the forearm near the wrist and abduct the humerus to approximately 45 degrees. With the other hand over the posterior superior aspect of the upper humerus, apply forward and downward pressure. Externally rotate the humerus by using the forearm as a lever. Perform the test in 45 degrees 90 degrees and 135 degrees of humeral abduction. If instability is present, the patient becomes apprehensive as may be witnessed by the facial expression and the patient will resist further external rotation. Anterior drawer test. The patient lies supine with the examiner standing at the side of the shoulder to be examined. The patient's hand is placed in the examiner's axilla and the patient must be cautioned to let the arm relax and not attempt to hold on. Abduct the humerus between 80 and 100 degrees with forward flexion up to 20 degrees and slight external rotation up to 30 degrees. Immobilize the scapula with the left hand, drawing the scapular spine forward with the fingers while applying counter pressure with the thumb against the coracoid. With the right hand, grasp the upper humerus and attempt to draw it anteriorly. Anterior instability, if present, can be graded by the examiner and also confirmed radiologically. Remember that, as in any other joint, testing for instability must be compared with the opposite extremity. Posterior instability. Posterior drawer test. With the patient lying supine and the examiner standing at the side, grasp the forearm and flex the elbow to approximately 120 degrees. Abduct the shoulder from 80 to 120 degrees and flex the shoulder approximately 20 to 30 degrees. With the other hand, stabilize the scapula with the fingers posteriorly on the spine and place the thumb at the lateral border of the coracoid process. Internally rotate the humerus, and while applying posterior pressure to the shoulder with the thumb, flex the humerus to approximately 60 to 80 degrees. Posterior subluxation or posterior displacement of the humeral head, if present, is appreciated by the thumb sliding posteriorly along the lateral border of the coracoid process. Inferior instability. With the patient standing and the arm in the neutral position, apply straight downward traction by grasping the lower end of the humerus. The patient must remain completely relaxed throughout the test. A positive test indicating inferior subluxation is demonstrated by the appearance of a sulcus or indentation forming beneath the acromion and anteriorly in the region of the acromioclavicular joint. The degree of inferior subluxation can easily be demonstrated radiologically. Examination of related areas. The examiner is reminded that the shoulder region is a common site for referred pain. Myocardial ischemia, diaphragmatic irritation, and cervical pathology can present with shoulder pain and thus these areas must be thoroughly examined during shoulder assessment. The elbow. The elbow is examined in a systematic fashion and in a pattern similar to that which you have just witnessed in the examination of the shoulder. 
The elbow, like the shoulder, is comprised of more than one articulation. The humeral radial joint, the humeral ulnar joint, and the proximal radial ulnar joint. Inspection. Note that during normal gait, the elbow is maintained in a position of slight flexion and the swing of the arm arises more proximally in the shoulder. Observe the patient from in front, with the arms held by the side, elbows extended, and the palms facing forward. Normally, there is slight valgus at the elbow in that the forearm appears to deviate laterally. This angulation is called the carrying angle. In the male, the carrying angle is approximately 5 degrees, while in the female, it is greater and measures 10 to 15 degrees. It is essential to compare both the right and the left side, which in the normal individual would be equal. In this female patient, there is an increased carrying angle on the right side measuring 18 degrees in contrast to the normal on the left side measuring 12 degrees. This patient had sustained a fracture of the lateral condyle as a child with the resultant increased carrying angle. Failure of an anatomical reduction of a supracondylar fracture or a growth disturbance in a child as a result of epiphyseal damage may result in a decreased or less than normal carrying angle, and this is known as cubitus ferris or the gunstock deformity. Inspect the elbow completely around the circumference looking for any soft tissue swelling, redness, or scars. Begin in the antecubital fossa and note any swelling or other abnormalities if present. Posteriorly, Note any swelling over the proximal end of the ulna, which may represent a rheumatoid nodule or an olecranon bursitis. Palpation. Bony landmarks. Lateral epicondyle. With the patient sitting in a relaxed position, the examiner supports the forearm so that the elbow is at 90 degrees of flexion and with the other hand, palpate the prominence on the lateral side known as the lateral epicondyle. It is rounded inferiorly, and tenderness to palpation in this region suggests the possibility of lateral epicondylitis or the tennis elbow syndrome. Further confirmation of a tennis elbow syndrome will be discussed later during special tests related to the elbow. Lateral supracondylar ridge. Palpate proximally to the lateral epicondyle and the examiner can appreciate a sharp edge on the lateral aspect of the humerus, known as the lateral supracondylar ridge. Radial head. Return to the prominence of the lateral epicondyle. Palpating in line with the forearm, approximately one centimeter distal to the lateral epicondyle, the examiner notes a depression. This is the location of the humeral radial joint. A further one centimeter distal, the head of the radius is encountered, and this bony prominence can be verified by pronating and supinating the forearm, which causes the head of the radius to rotate under the examiner's palpating thumb. By gently pronating fully and then supinating fully, Approximately 75% of the circumference of the radial head can be palpated. Proximal ulna and olecranon. In the midline on the posterior aspect of the proximal forearm, the examiner can identify the subcutaneous ridge of the proximal ulna. Grasp the ridge between the thumb and forefinger and follow it proximally to the flared olecranon which articulates with the trochlea of the distal humerus. Medial epicondyle. With the elbow in full extension, proceed horizontally to the medial aspect of the elbow 
and the prominence encountered is the medial epicondyle. Now flex the elbow to 90 degrees and the medial epicondyle can be grasped between the thumb and the index finger for accurate localization. Medial supracondylar ridge. The examiner should palpate proximally from the medial epicondyle along the medial supracondylar ridge, but because of overlying soft tissue, this is less distinct than the lateral supracondylar ridge. The examiner should note that posteriorly, with the elbow in extension, the lateral epicondyle, tip of the olecranon, and medial epicondyle form a straight line. With the thumb, index, and mid fingers placed on these bony landmarks, note that when the elbow is flexed to 90 degrees, an isosceles triangle is formed with the apex, the tip of the olecranon, and the base formed by a line joining the medial and lateral epicondyle. Examining the relationships of these bony landmarks is important in clinically assessing the reduction of a supracondylar or a distal humeral fracture. Palpation. Soft tissues. Begin palpation anteriorly in the antecubital fossa. The arm should be relaxed with the elbow in slight flexion. Carefully palpate the region of the antecubital fossa, noting any tenderness, swelling, or masses. Note any temperature difference as compared to the opposite side. Biceps tendon. In the midline of the antecubital fossa, the biceps tendon passes from proximal to distal. This can be accentuated by asking the patient to flex the supinated arm against resistance and should be palpated proximally into the belly of the biceps muscle. Brachial artery. Just medial to the biceps tendon, the brachial artery can be palpated in the antecubital fossa. Lateral aspect. With the index finger on the lateral side of the biceps tendon and the thumb on the lateral epicondyle, the examiner can grasp the mobile wad of muscle, which consists of the brachial radialis medially and the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis laterally. Posterior aspect. The region of the olecranon bursa overlying the posterior aspect of the olecranon should be palpated. Swelling, thickening, or nodularity should be noted. Olecranon fossa. With the elbow partially flexed, the examiner notes a depression just proximal to the bony confines of the olecranon. This is the olecranon fossa, which is covered by the triceps tendon and is more readily appreciated if the triceps is relaxed and the forearm supported by the examiner. Triceps tendon. Instructing the patient to extend the elbow against resistance makes the triceps tendon palpable and easily distinguishable. This should be followed proximally to the muscle belly of the triceps. Medial aspect. Ulnar nerve. With the forearm supported and the elbow flexed to 90 degrees, return to the previously identified medial epicondyle, and posteriorly the examiner can identify a cord-like structure, the ulnar nerve, by gently rolling it beneath the fingers. This must be done gently, or the patient may complain of paresthesias or pain extending to the ulnar distribution of the hand. Carefully assess the stability of the nerve in the cubital tunnel or groove behind the medial epicondyle. Palpate in the region of the medial supracondylar ridge, proximal to the medial epicondyle. In the normal individual, the supratrochlear lymph node is not usually palpable, but in infectious conditions involving the forearm or hand, this node is usually readily palpable and tender. Common flexor origin. The pronator teres, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, 
and flexor carpi ulnaris muscles originate as a common tendon from the medial epicondyle, and this region should be carefully palpated. Range of motion. Flexion and extension of the elbow occur at the humeral radial and humeral ulnar joints. Supination and pronation involves the humeral radial joint and both proximal and distal radial ulnar joints. Thus, loss of supination or pronation may indicate pathology at the elbow region, the wrist region, or both and extreme care must be taken to distinguish the precise cause of loss of either supination or pronation. The examiner must assess active motion and, if abnormal, passive range of motion for flexion, extension, supination, and pronation. Range of motion, active. Flexion. Observe the patient in the standing position from the side. Instruct the patient to bring the palm upwards and to try and touch the anterior aspect of the shoulder. Measure the angle of flexion, which is normally 135 to 150 degrees. Extension. Instruct the patient to straighten the arm by the side. Most males can normally extend to zero to plus five degrees, but many females may be able to hyperextend to minus five degrees. Always compare the range of motion with the opposite extremity. Pronation, supination. The examiner should stand in front of the patient and instruct the patient to keep the elbows flexed to 90 degrees and in tight at the side to prevent any substitution of pronation or supination by shoulder movements. The palm should be vertical to the floor and the patient is then instructed to turn the palms downwards towards the floor, pronation, and upwards towards the ceiling, supination. Normal patients have 85 to 90 degrees of pronation and 90 degrees of supination. Allowing the patient to grasp a pencil in each palm allows the examiner to readily note any difference between the two sides. In this patient who has a proximal radial ulnar synostosis or cross union on his right side, there is no true pronation or supination. But if the elbow is not maintained at the side, shoulder movements can compensate significantly. Range of motion, passive. If active motion has been abnormal, Passive motion should be assessed by the examiner while palpating the elbow region. The elbow joint complex is superficial and crepitations during any of the ranges of motion can be appreciated by the examiner. Neurological examination. The neurological examination related to the elbow would be conducted at this time but is covered in the video program on the examination of the cervical spine and neurological examination of the upper extremities. Special tests. Ligamentous stability. With the patient supine and relaxed, the elbow region is cupped by the examiner's hand. Hold the forearm and slightly flex the elbow. Apply a valgus stress and carefully palpate medially for any opening. Then apply medial or varus stress and likewise palpate laterally for any opening along the lateral joint line. Lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow syndrome. Tenderness elicited at the extensor origin on the lateral epicondyle may suggest the possibility of a tennis elbow syndrome. Supporting the elbow, instruct the patient to make a fist and extend the wrist while applying resistance to the dorsal aspect of the hand. Pain felt in the proximal region of the wrist extensors or significant tenderness at their origin on the lateral epicondyle would further substantiate the diagnosis of a tennis elbow syndrome. Medial epicondylitis 
or golfer's elbow. Less frequently, pain arises from the common flexor origin at the medial epicondyle. Having the patient flex the fist against resistance will produce pain in the proximal flexor region and the medial epicondyle. This condition is known as a golfer's elbow. Ulnar nerve. Injury or compression of the ulnar nerve in the region of the cubital tunnel where it traverses behind the medial epicondyle frequently results in increased sensitivity of the nerve. Gently tapping the ulnar nerve behind the medial epicondyle may result in paresthesias or tingling sensations down the ulnar aspect of the forearm and into the ulnar distribution of the hand. This completes the examination of the shoulder and elbow region. But with any symptomatology related to this region, a complete examination of the cervical spine, hand and wrist is essential.